It's the next level. <laughs> Well, well, well. You're quite the opponent, Pilgrim. Who the hell are you anyway? My name is Matthew Patel, and I'm Ramona's first evil ex-boyfriend. For what? Anyone need another drink? <laughs> Get my email explaining the situation? I skimmed it. Mm -mm. You will pay for your insolence! to the show panelers i'm steve and i am joined tonight by two very special guests of mine friends of mine and special guests Paik and ben uh, we're going to discuss the movie scott pilgrim versus the world guys introduce <laughs> yourselves <laughs> all right um sure i guess i'll go first <laughs> yeah, go ahead chuckles you're first all right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, hey, you were you were recently on Run for Your Lives, and you laughed just as much as I did. So I did. You're right. Nah, don't even. Don't even. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah. So I am. I'm Paik, and I am typically usually on Run for Your Lives on the Pirate Core Entertainment Network. And me and Daphne have been doing monster movies, creature features, disaster films over there. And then I've also been on Strange Indeed for the past like six months or whatever. And then Ben's <laughs> hopping over there to do some extra stuff pretty soon and i'll still pop in time to time but yeah that's where that's who i am and where i am <laughs> thanks for uh for stealing my plug there i appreciate it i didn't say what you're doing no you didn't <laughs> but it's fine uh <laughs> nope, i'm i'm ben i am a uh a return guest to panels to pixels uh but i'm also the host of the spotlight podcast uh on the Next Level Podcast Network, of which Panel to Pixels is a part of. I am going to be launching the Wilhelm Podcast starting January 2021st, which is a film roundtable podcast. And as Pake mentioned, I'm going to be hopping over for the next 10 weeks as co-host of Strange Indeed uh, with Rima to cover The Stand, uh, which is going to be a lot of fun. And last but not least, I'm a bigger fan of Scott Pilgrim than Pake, so we can move on. Whoa, <laughs> shots fired already. I don't um, think so. No, I, in all honesty, I do think Pink is probably a bigger fan of this movie than I am. I'm not going to lie. That was going to kind of be... That's a, that's a hill alpha. <laughs> that, uh, that was kind of going to be, be my first my first kind of thought. I, I didn't tell you guys about this beforehand, but uh, why don't you both just, just tell me about your exposure to this movie, why you're such big fans of it. And what is it about the movie? Maybe if there's something you can you can pull from specifically that makes it such a great movie for you. Man, um, I mean, I saw it right when it first came out. And first of all, I mean, directing, it's Edgar Wright. Anything Edgar Wright does and touches is incredible. The way he makes music a character in his movies, the way he knows how to like blend humor with other genres. And so I fell in love with this movie mainly just because it it was a lot of who I was at that time in life and kind of still am but I mean it's just a big mix I mean it's such a love letter to video game culture and music culture indie music culture and just nerddom in general and just like pop culture and you know action sequences and goofy humor and so yeah and, and like a coming of age like a young adult coming of age kind of thing so all of that combined I was like this is a movie that just speaks to me on a very deep level and it's really quotable and fun. <laughs> yeah, very cool. Yeah, you pretty much hit the nail on the head when you said Edgar Wright. I mean, that was the <laughs> that was the first thing that kind of drew me to this movie. I um I 
and this is what's really going to shine that makes a bigger fan than I am. Uh, I completely missed this movie in theaters. I did not see it until it had already come out on DVD, Blu-ray. And it took a friend to introduce me to it. I'm, I'm a massive fan of Edgar Wright from the Cornetto trilogy, a.k.a. Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, and The World's End. And it took a friend of mine saying, like, well, if you're a fan of all those movies, you really should check this out showed me the trailer to Scott Pilgrim and I just remember watching the trailer in awe and being like, oh, I know that person. Hey, I know him. I know her. I know her. This is amazing. I want to watch this movie tomorrow. And, yeah. and I think I ended up doing exactly that. I think I ended up going out and just from the trailer alone, buying the Blu-ray nice, and watching it and never regretting that purchase. It's Again, this is like one of those movies that we were talking about this when we were prepping or when we were getting ready to do this. I, I didn't have to prep mm -hmm. for this podcast because I've seen this movie so many times. Yeah. And and Paik and I, when we have our like our game night calls and stuff like that, it, people know how much we love this movie because Paik and I will just go on quote fests <laughs> about this movie. <laughs> And, 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 you know, just to further Pake's point, it, it's such, as you mentioned, it's just a love letter to video games and comic books and just all out fun. It's just a fantastic movie. Very cool. Well, for me, I didn't really, I didn't see this movie in the theaters. I wasn't exposed to it. It was one of those things that I don't remember how soon after it came out on disc that I picked it up, but I did. I, I watched it. I, I really liked it. It didn't, it didn't really resonate with me, I think, just because I'm not uh, as much into video games. But this last week, watching it a couple of times has really renewed kind of, a, or get, not renewed, probably given me a love, a love for it that I will definitely revisit it more often than I have in the past because I think it's, it's got a lot of heart and it's, it's really cool to see Scott Pilgrim's arc through this, this movie, his character that mm -hmm. you don't always get a lot of that in, in some movies, but to see how he, how he changes and grows is, is really pretty cool. Yeah. So that's, let's, let's kind of hit on that for a minute. Let's talk about the story and kind of a, a quick, if people don't know, I don't know why you would be listening to us if you haven't seen this movie, <laughs> but it's basically the story of Scott, who is a 22 year old unemployed guy who has a 17 year old, currently has a 17 year old quote unquote girlfriend. Fake who, high school girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. Fake high school girlfriend. <laughs> and uh, he has a dream about a girl and then he meets that girl. And then the movie takes off from there to where he has to battle her seven evil exes. And I loved the running gag of every time he would say boyfriends and she would just go exes. Yep. And it took him almost three quarters of the way through the movie before he was like, wait a minute, why do you keep correcting me on that? <laughs> oh, it, the first time I saw the movie, it took me the same amount of time to figure out exactly why she kept saying that. <laughs> You're just like Scott who has that thing in his head that goes to no clue and gets it. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'm by furious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but what do you guys, what is it, you know, you talked about the story a little bit earlier, but let's talk about like the whole range of it, how we go from at the beginning, he's with this, this high school girl, which there's one point where he's, you know, he's five years older than her. And he says something about the age difference. And she's like, well, my dad's nine years older than my mom. And so we don't, we never really get the kind of douchey vibe from him. Is that because of the time frame you think when the movie came out or is it just, they're so innocent looking both of them? Well, I, I don't think it's that you don't get the douchey factor from him. I, I, I do think in some ways there's, there's a little bit of an ick feet guy. Oh yeah. Factor. He's painted as quite an asshole like, <laughs> in many moments in this movie where you're like, Dude, you got to do the right thing here. Like, <laughs> yeah, but not only that, like I, one of the things I really like about this movie is it's, I don't want to call it a coming of age because it's really not a coming of age. But when yeah. you follow Scott's character, it's, it's one of those things. It's a transition that every person in their life has gone through. And it's that transition from high school to adulthood. Yeah. And there's that, there's that phase that you're, when you're kind of stuck in the middle where you still want to go back to high school because of the fun that, that you had, or for some people, some people want to do it to get the <laughs> hell out of high school. But, you know, I was one of those people that I missed high school when I wasn't in it anymore. And I was making that transition to adult and you kind of, 
you know, I I freely admit, I remember the year after high school, I was still dating someone who was a senior in high school. And because I was going through that transition, just like Scott was. So I think in many ways, while it's it's exemplified and it's exaggerated, it's something that a lot of people can kind of connect with. And I think that's one of the reasons why it hits home with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And then the, the moral, I guess, backbone or whatever of the movie, because you do see it, there's an arc that Scott goes through where, like you said, there's that ick factor. You're like, okay, really, dude, like you're 22 at this point. You're still like hung on to this like high school girl who like is worried about like what classes she's in and what her friends are doing. And well, like, obviously you have an like, adult life that you need to start heading towards. You have this band you're wanting to work on. He's, he says he's between jobs. Who knows how long it's been since he's like had a job and focused on like a career and like real adult life. And yet he's still acting like this kid where he's just like worried about what girl he thinks is hot and who he wants to date. And so I love that you get, you know, Michael Sarah plays it really well to where like you get the innocence and the like sweetness of the character to where it really helps balance that. But he's not the greatest guy, but I love that, you know, at the end, it's not necessarily the power of love towards somebody else, but he earns the power of self-respect. That's where it is, is being able to love himself before he's like loving other people randomly. Well, and I love, cause I, you know, at the end of the story, we have this nega, uh, nega Scott comes mm -hmm. out and you think there's going to be this huge battle. And then it's just the two of them walking out together going, yeah, we're going to have brunch uh, next week. Yeah. Uh, you he's know, kind of a nice guy, guy actually. Yeah, we, we're a lot like, <laughs> a lot yeah. Common, yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, yeah, it's, it's really that, that understanding or, or I guess he does play it really well to where, but you also see, there's a hardness that he develops even towards Ramona when, when he's in the bar and after he's been, or before he's been attacked by Roxy or before he has to fight Roxy, he's sitting in the bar and he's just treating Ramona like crap. And he's drinking these gin and tonics or was that after the fight? No, it was drink, before. It was before the fight. Okay. But there's this, this edge to him and it feels like he's got to get past that as well. He's got to get past the annoyance of fighting these fights. And I love that it's, it's knives is the one at the end who points out to him, you've been fighting all this time for her and you're going to let her just walk away. So yeah, he does grow throughout the movie. Well, I, I think one of the interesting things, and you brought up the Nega Scott, and, and I think one of the interesting things about that too, is that kind of moment at the end about how they walk out of the club together and they're like, they're deciding to go get brunch. I mean, the Nega is supposed to be the complete opposite of a person, but how do you have a complete opposite of someone when the person that they are kind of already rides the line between good and bad? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how Scott is like, yes, he defends his friends. He, he fights for the love of Ramona. But at the same time, he's dating a high schooler, which is kind of ick. He's mm -hmm. a complete jerk to Ramona a number of times. He himself is kind of like a yin and yang of himself. So how do you have the yin to your yang when you yourself are the yin and yang? Mm -hmm. So at the end, when he's facing himself, the nega version of himself, the nega version of himself is basically already him. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you know, so it good. just it's 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 such a great moment when they walk out together, um, you know, and they decide to get brunch, which yeah. is just hysterical. <laughs> And I, I love within within the story as we're we're talking about this as he as he meets each like I love how the first one sends him an email and he and Ramona haven't even actually dated yet when he gets this email that they're supposed to fight and uh, he gets halfway through the email and he's like this is boring <laughs> delete <laughs> you know he gets to the duel to the death part and he's like ugh delete you know <laughs> uh, and uh, i love how offended uh is it matthew matt patel, matthew patel. Yeah. Yeah. Matthew patel yeah. gets when he finds out oh yeah i didn't actually uh read I your skimmed email it. <laughs> I skimmed, <laughs> skimmed it skimmed it uh and then wallace and then says lucas, that looks mm -mm. Mm -mm. <laughs> and then of course lucas lee starts to kind of explain it to him and uh, i did have a question is i noticed in this last watch that the the third guy todd had a three on his shirt yeah um is is there does does every fight because i only saw it with the three i saw it with the four above the bar every x has a number of correlation yeah. well, to them Matthew throughout Patel, the movie i don't remember seeing well he's the first so it's he's it's kind first, of you see. but lucas yeah. lee has a has a two tattoo on his neck yeah okay okay 
And then, yeah, Todd Ingram wears his three shirt. Roxy it meets them at the four club. And then the Katnayagi twins are five and six. And both of them also have, like, something that they're wearing that's, like, one of them is, like, a like different character that means five or okay. has a five. And then the other one is, like, a different character that means six. Whatever. I was wondering about that. So on their shirts there. Okay. So that, that makes sense is that – because I couldn't pick – I did see – I and saw the two. I saw Gideon's the four. Triforce thing on his tie – it's like G's, but it also kind of has like a seven like theme. To it okay, also. see, I didn't, I didn't catch that. <laughs> not, not looking uh, too carefully. Oh, there, at there it. are a number of hidden gems in this movie. Oh yeah, <laughs> that it, it really takes multiple viewings, and even in multiple viewings, you don't always catch them. Like the number correlations, oh, yeah. the number correlations is one thing that you do eventually catch on to when you've seen a number of times. But something that even took me a while to notice is that. Every time Ramona changes her hair color, the star on her bag changes color as well to match her hair. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Very cool. Yeah. There's, there's so many. Little, there's a lot of hidden gems. Right. Yeah. Like when they're when they're riding the bus and talking about, like, well, are we going to date? The the lights in the background are shaped like hearts. Like the little oh, okay. like, lights. Or before, when they're going to their that first concert or that, like, first show, before when he fights Patel – they're walking down the street and there's a flight center behind them but the L is like blinking out to where it says fight center on it, which oh, is really cool. Okay. Right. There's like a lot of little like X's in the snow or like he's like uh, like walking with this like railroad crossing. It has like seven different X signs on them, but two of them are wiped yeah. out. I that's saw easy. that. Yeah. That's before Ingram. So <laughs> Yeah. Very and even, cool. And even as Pekin mentioned too, when, you know, mentioning about like the mute, how Edgar Wright is, pretty much a genius when it comes to tying in music to the story and the music itself becomes a story there's a scene at the end when scott is is i think it's either right before or right after he faces the katanyagi twins and he talks to knives chow who is a 17 year old the song in the background is a song called anthem of a 17 year old oh wow <laughs> so there's again it's like you really have there's so many gems in this movie that unless you watch commentaries or read about them, you'll miss some of them. Yeah. Right. Right. Interesting. I'll, I'll, and the other thing that caught me this last viewing or, or the viewing it this week is the editing is there's some very specific editing choices that are made to where they zip in and out of, of scenes and you don't realize you've transitioned to a whole new scene until Scott wakes up or, or Scott gets out of his daydream. And that really caught me. It caught me off guard a little bit, but I appreciated it because it, it made the, the, it made it almost like a comic book mm-hmm, to yeah. where you can go from panel to panel. And when you turn a page, you're on a completely different, different scene sometimes. Oh yeah. And there's so many like nods and, you know, stuff towards different styles. There's a lot of like anime styles where like they're talking in the, their heads or like the different panels or when he's when the fight with Roxy starts it starts with Roxy fighting Ramona and that glass that the disco ball shatters and it kind of builds as like this like character select screen from like Mm -hmm. a video game kind of thing is what it looks like or when he's fighting Matthew Patel and every like strike and hit there's like dust popping off of him like it's like an old kung fu movie right so let's talk a little bit about the characters and I don't mean just the the main we've talked we've talked about Scott but let's talk about some of the the side characters here I had forgotten that Anna Kendrick is oh, in this, how can you this. Forget <laughs> about I, Anna I know I'm terrible I'm horrible that I didn't that I didn't That's my I saw girl. Her name. Um, <laughs> but you know she plays Scott's uh, younger sister she's 19 is that right is it three years younger 18, 18 okay yeah. so she's just barely out of high school but yet she has she and Scott's roommate have this constant, uh, almost <laughs> automatic communication uh, between all this that gossip. Oh, bitch. it's so <laughs> pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, some of those side characters. What do you think about them? If you had to choose a favorite side character, and I would hate to to put you on the spot, but like yeah, uh, aside ooh. from our oh, main geez. three, <laughs> our our main three, which would be uh, I would consider Scott Knives and and Ramona kind of our main three, this love triangle kind of we have going on. What about those side characters? I don't know about you, Pake, but I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to kind of exclude the evil exes because I think they're yeah. kind of in a category all their own. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. we could probably touch on like which one of them is our like favorite the, as well. well. We'll get to those. We'll get to those also. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm such a fan of young Neil. Young nice. Neil's fun. <laughs> He's, I mean, his, his lines, him, he, his quotes, 
he has so many quotable lines himself. Mm-hmm. I mean, like when Knives asks him, like, what do you play? And he's like, oh, that's such a big question. <laughs> I love that. Zelda. Zelda. Tetris. <laughs> Tetris. Yeah. And like, but I mean, even the little quips, like when he's he's in, he's kind of like the groupie of the band, but even as the groupie of the band, he still doesn't know all the words to their yeah. music. <laughs> oh no. Uh, ah. my. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> by the way, we don't have to talk quotes of this movie. Pake and I are just gonna throw them in every chance. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely do that. Do that for sure. Uh, but it's yeah, I I would have have to say of all the side characters excluding the evil exes i mean of of course i mean of course there's envy but i gotta go with young neil i i love young neil okay what about you pick any of them stand out to you yeah i mean they all stand out in their own ways but i think a very close second is gonna be julie played by Ari plaza just because She's got some real fun moments. She's everywhere. She works everywhere. And she's so Audrey Plaza <laughs> yeah, in this exactly. movie. Yeah. How are you doing that thing with your mouth? <laughs> Never mind. I'm trying to doing it. No, yeah. but, I, but I think my favorite, just the attitude, the sass. I love Wallace. I really do. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, I love the scene. And I, I don't she's think I get in. Huh? <laughs> It's probably because he's better than you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I caught it uh, the the first few times I watched it, but then I, I suddenly realized that in in the scene with the first battle of the bands, he's looking at Jimmy, and then a few minutes later, he and Jimmy are kissing, and you hear uh, Anna Kendrick Wallace go, again? again. Yeah, and I was so like, your gay friends. I said bye. <laughs> you gay know, friend. gay friends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and for me, the, the one of the ones that stood out in this most recently in this this watch that I did that really stood out to me was Knives. I'm assuming that's her sister. Yeah. The, the girl who's with her is, is you know, she's there. And it's almost like nobody even acknowledges her existence except for Knives. Like mm-hmm. Knives is the only one who even realizes that she's there. But yet she has some very pivotal moments. I mean, when, when Knives passes out there, she's the one to catch her. When Knives is crying in the bathroom and trying to, she's like, should this be stinging? Um, <laughs> oh, you should rinse, <laughs> you know? Um, well, I, don't, I don't think that's her sister. I think that's just a friend. Just a friend. Okay, could be. They never really say, so. Either, either way, but, it just, it's. But in the but, list of credits, she has a different last name. Okay, okay, well then maybe she's just another one of the, yeah. the schoolgirls. But it just she stood out to me just because because of the fact that it seemed like no one else even acknowledged that she existed except for mm-hmm. knives. And and I understand that because she's not really part of their story. But I just thought that was that was interesting to me. And then of course Wallace uh, is is uh, Karen Culkin, who I don't think I'd ever seen him in anything. If you've seen Home Alone, well, I mean, except for his. I mean, does he play play briefly in there? In Home Alone? Yeah. No, he's uh he's Fuller. Oh, okay. Is in he Home Fuller? Alone. I did not I did not realize that he's that he's Fuller. Okay. Yeah. Well then but this is the first time I've seen him doing anything. Okay. <laughs> I, I guess is what I mean. <laughs> um and so it really it, it, it was yeah. it was interesting to see that that, uh, that this family uh, kind of had to act. So I think you've seen Kieran a number of times and you just don't realize that it's him. That's probably true. Because he's also, I don't know if you've ever seen Father of the Bride or Father of the Bride Part 2. Oh, yeah. He's the son. He's Steve Martin's son. Oh, wow. Yeah, I totally didn't even know. So, yeah, you're right. (laughs) I'm completely, so that's, that's, I'm completely wrong. The Culkins yeah. get around in weird places. You never know where you're going to pop up. As we continue They're on, like gremlins, you put some water on them and they multiply. Uh, with the characters, <laughs> let's let's talk about the evil exes and kind of talk about the fights a little bit. And the, the very first one is the Matthew Patel Matthew fight. Matthew where... Patel, <laughs> look out! It's that one it's guy. That guy, <laughs> Scott, evil ex fight. I, I love. Fight. Yeah, I love that that uh, that. Wallace is the one almost every time who's got to remind him, hey, you got to fight, you know? Yeah. But that, that that first fight, you know, it's it's one of those things that, that he doesn't know what's going on at all until this guy this guy just starts fighting him and, and he doesn't realize what's going on until it's, it's almost too late. But he's he finally starts to defend himself and we see him using those video game moves and and really, really impressive. But the second fight, though, I think is the one that for me – the one with the multiple with the stunt team and all those yeah. multiple things going on there. The Lucas Lee fight. The Lucas Lee yeah. fight. Yes. I want to have his gay babies. 
Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Lee, big fan. Oh, Why I didn't get did? his autograph. <laughs> yeah. And he sends him down that, you know, I, I thought it was interesting. He used an interesting tactic to defeat him too. Cause he, he finally, he doesn't actually fight him to defeat him. He, he strokes his ego. He, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And he, Bet you can't do a thingy on that rail over there. The grind, bro. <laughs> Bet you can't do a grindy thingy. There's like 200 <laughs> steps, and those rails are for crap. Um, <laughs> so you can't do it. Yeah, it's it's great how, how every time he gets another, it's 1,000 and then 2,000 points when he, he defeats them. But for you guys, mm-hmm. of, of the seven fights or eight fights, if you consider fighting Gideon twice, what was your favorite or what stands out to you in those fights? You, you can kick it off his time, Peg. Oh, man. Again, it's one of those things, like, they're all so special in their own way. But I think as far as, like, quotability and one that's just really fun has got to be the Todd Ingram mm-hmm. fight. The base battle's really cool, but then it's the whole vegan thing. Like, that square off at the end is hilarious. Yeah. I um, <laughs> I, See, I'm of two different minds of this. My favorite fight is the Lucas Lee fight. Yeah. My favorite ex is Todd. And only because I'm going to name drop here, I have actually gotten to talk to Brandon Routh about playing that character. Oh, me too. I actually, I, I, when I met Brandon, it was one of those things I was like, yeah, I know. It's like, he's like Superman and he's the Adam and all this. It was like, but I told him, I was just like, you've done all these, like, but honestly, you're always talking about me. And that's that's almost exactly how. And he lit up. He was just like, That's almost exactly how I was, too. I met him. I I (laughs) moderated a panel with him and a number of other castmates from Legends of Tomorrow, which is the show that he was on at the time. Mm -hmm. And I just, I introduced myself to each of the cast members backstage before we go on set, or before we go on stage, which is what I usually did. But when I was talking to Brandon, I'm like, look, I'm like, I know you were Superman. I know you're playing Ray Palmer right now. You've done so many other things. I, I, I don't think this will come up on stage, so I have to talk about it now. I was like, you are fucking fantastic in Scott Pilgrim versus the world. <laughs> and it was the same reaction. He, he completely lit up, almost like he yeah. loves talking about Scott Pilgrim, but he doesn't get to do it as much as he wants to mm-hmm. because he played Superman and because he played Ray Palmer on Legends of Tomorrow. Yeah. It kind of gets pushed to the back burner for him. So because mm-hmm. I was able to have that conversation with him, he, he is my favorite of the X's. Very cool. Yeah, he's great. I even remember just being like chicken, like on like the yeah. cat photo um, for them. What year? But, what year did this movie come out? What was it? Twenty ten. Yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, I can see why I probably missed it. Um, Twenty ten was a big year for me, so um, I don't know why I said that. Um, but let's talk <laughs> about some of the all of the different actors who in twenty ten, Chris Evans was already Captain America. Was he? Was he? I don't remember. I, I guess he, he had already been Johnny Storm in the Fantastic Four. Okay. But I don't think he was Captain America just yet. I think he was, he might have been cast, mm-hmm. but I don't think the first Captain America movie had hit yet. So, how many of these actors that we're talking about? And, yeah, that and was we the can next run year. Them, so, he might have been cast. We can, we can run them down, or you, you guys could better list all these, these actors that are well known now. How well known were they in 2010? Who was the biggest name on this movie in 2010? Oh, Michael Sarah, absolutely, absolutely. Michael Sarah, because he was off the off the heels of yeah, Super right, Bad and right. stuff like that. So, but a, but a lot of these people were kind of still relatively up and comers. Aubrey Plaza, I think, was, had just started Parks and Rec, mm-hmm. if not maybe a couple seasons in by the time this had started. Brie Larson had really done maybe a little bit of community and Mm -hmm. some smaller things, but she wasn't nearly the star that she is now. Yeah. Anna Kendrick was still relatively new. I think maybe, I don't know if the first Twilight had come out yet or not. It had, she had already done two Twilight movies, I think by the time she had done this. Okay. So if you're like a Wes Anderson fan, then a people, of course, Jason Schwartzman, somebody that you right. really recognize because he had already done a lot of that stuff. But I think Schwartzman was probably the second biggest name on this film. Mm-hmm. But as far as mainstream, there's a lot of people in this movie who, after this movie, just took off. Oh, yeah. I always love saying, you know, about like Chris Evans, Brie Larson, Brandon Routh. I was like, 
it was like one of those like you see that on Facebook pop ups like you know your favorite movie without using the actual title or characters and stuff in the movie is like it's that movie that awkward uh, Canadian kid has to fight Captain America <laughs> and Superman right. so he can get over his breakup yep, with Captain right. Marvel. <laughs> <laughs> and at one point, the Punisher comes in and uh, yeah. <laughs> and step and and helps him win a fight against Superman. Like yeah. it's yeah, I mean there are I think a minimum of four people who have gone on to become comic book royalty. Very cool. uh, I was going to ask that because I who were those two actors that played the vegan police? Thomas Jane and uh, Clifton, Clifton Collins. Collins. Yeah, yep. Thomas Jane was the one who was it was tickling my brain, going, "I know that guy, and I cannot, I cannot <laughs> place Still him." The, I, I mean, Bernthal's great. Thomas Jane will always be my Punisher. He he was good. He was good. <laughs> uh, he's no Dolph Lundgren. Oh God! <laughs> Just can I, kidding. Can I sign off of this podcast now? <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so, uh, a couple of questions. I more questions that I have about the movie. Was he originally supposed to end up with knives? Is that there is an alternate alternate okay. ending where okay. he does? Mm-hmm. So there there was an alternate ending, but it did. It maybe it didn't mm-hmm. play well with uh, with audiences. Yeah, I've I've seen it. It after seeing the original so many times, and like that being like. Mm -hmm. movie it is weird to watch the alternate ending where he just lets ramona wander off and then him and knives get back together and it because it almost like it reverts him back to where he was at because like the movie ends that same way with like the continue countdown except it's on the screen of ninja ninja revolution they just go back to the arcade and like hang out like they did in the beginning of the movie right okay and it's it's kind of weird it's one of those endings that kind of un like you said pink it's kind of one of those endings that kind of undoes every character development that he's gone through yeah yeah you know, it's it's one of the reasons why, and I hate using this as a reference, it's one of those reasons why when I watched Grease for the first time earlier this year, I hated it. <laughs> because the whole movie is about Sandy trying to not change mm-hmm. to help, you know, Danny, or to get to be with Danny. And then what does she do at the end of the movie? She changes. Yeah. Like, you just completely mm. undid this entire fucking movie. <laughs> that's that's always bothered me about Grease. I don't, that I don't like about it, but. You will never hear Grease in correlation to Scott Pilgrim ever again after that. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> but let's see. What else, uh, what else haven't we discussed that, uh, that you guys want to talk about? I could go on for hours about this, but, you know, I think uh, other bands and stuff. I mean, we get like the stuff where they're, they're open for the Clash of Demon Head, which. I love that. He's like, I hate you. A gig is a gig is a gig is a gig is a gig. It's a gig. (laughs) (laughs) That one's fun. But I still think my favorite is their first battle where Matthew Patel shows up because they're, they're facing crash and the boys, you know, next, the first band we got to fight is crash and the boys. Oh, is that that one band with Crash yeah, and the and the boys? Yeah, boys. That, was, that was that was they're like they're like at the sound check we sucked, you know, <laughs> and <laughs> because that first song that they play, which is I am so sad, I'm so very very sad. I I used to be in a band and we played local shows and opened for bigger bands that came through and stuff. And my band did a cover of that song, and I I did I delivered it the same way as Crash, except with letting it know it was a cover for any Scott Pilgrim fans. I was like, this next song is a cover. It's called I Am So, so Sad. Very, very sad. So very, very sad. <laughs> and it goes something like a... this. <laughs> and we just yeah. did the whole, we did the thing, you know, so <laughs> sad. Thank you. And then we just continued with our set. And it was like, see, not a race, guys. I was just going to say, you need <laughs> yeah. somebody, for, not you a race, need somebody from backstage going, not a race, guys. <laughs> this next song is for the guy that keeps yelling from the balcony. Hey, it's called Please Die. <laughs> Please Die. <laughs> Which, in a, there's an extended scene of that where they actually have that song be its own song that oh because it literally goes we hate you we hate you we hate you die (laughs) and then it's over and then they go into the song that they then play as we hate you please die which is in that extended scene they call it something like a the entire audience dies at the end of this song (laughs) and he's like this will be our last song tonight and there was forever. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I love oh, the man. glare from the from the uh, the other girl drummer at Kim while she's playing. Like Kim is glaring <laughs> is at her. That girl on board too. <laughs> yes, she is. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, but then, like you see her in the wings, and she's just just giving that killing stare to Kim as she's playing mm-hmm. the drums. I have to say too, while we're on the topic of of the music and such, Pake, it's it's really fitting that we're doing this podcast today. Because we've been waiting for it for a while. The pre-orders for those vinyls officially oh, yeah. went live today. So nice. uh, I might be getting some of them soon. Very cool. Yeah, you should. Very. 
I have like a previous like set that came out a couple of years like back then, or like colored vinyl and all this stuff. But yeah, of course, yeah, I've got Scott Pilgrim <laughs> soundtrack vinyls and everything too. But yeah, these new ones are like picture discs with like the characters on them and stuff. Those look yeah. really cool. Well, and it's the cool. and it's the first issue of the soundtrack that has the Brie Larson version of Black Sheep. Black Sheep. Yeah, yeah, because the one that I have is the metric version yeah. of it. Nice. Uh, you guys are talking about stuff that I have no clue about. <laughs> and I love it. I love it. It's, I love being on here with you guys because you guys love this movie so much. Uh, what is there anything else you want to talk about from this movie? I mean, I know we've not gone super long, but. I, I don't know. I mean, it's just there's something about this movie that is just it, it's a total comfort movie for me. Like it's mm -hmm. one of those movies that because it's so fun and it's so pop culture esque that. It, I, it's one of those movies I can pop on no matter what kind of mood I'm in, and I'm always in a better mood when I'm done watching it. Very There's cool. those <laughs> movies that, like, if you're flipping through the channels, you come across that you have to stop and watch if you come across it. And it right. doesn't matter what point of the movie it's in. It could be the first five minutes or or literally a minute before the end credits start rolling. You're going to stop. This is one <laughs> of those movies for me. I don't watch movies on TV anymore, so that never happens. Right. But you get the point I'm, mm -hmm. I'm trying to make. Absolutely. You know, yeah. it's just, there's just so many comforts about this movie from the music to the quotes, just to the, the familiar faces in it that just make it so easy to watch. Oh, yeah. And I went down a huge rabbit hole this last time re-watching it and to where I ended up making a whole list on my Google Maps of all the filming <laughs> locations and where they actually are. So if anybody wants to hang out with me in Toronto sometime <laughs> in the future when we're able to do that. I was going to say, Pake's planning. I know, where, I know where we can go. We can go get a slice of pizza pizza, go get a cup of coffee, or we'll get a caramel macchiato for bleep pilgrim. <laughs> <laughs> at the coffee shop, go see a show at Lee's Palace, hang out at the park. Note grind those steps next to Casa Loma. <laughs> Um, <laughs> He's going to plan a trip to, to Canada very, very soon. When we very can. Cool. When we can. Yeah, when you don't have yeah. to quarantine for two weeks. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, guys. I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping stuff real quick, and then uh, we'll get your final thoughts and what you're – you've already kind of talked about what you're doing, but you'll I'll let you recap that as I do some, some quick housekeeping stuff for Panels to Pixels here. We do appreciate uh, – all the feedback that we get when we get feedback and you can send that to our Facebook page. It's facebook.com slash panels to pixels. We have an email address panels to pixels one at gmail.com. That's panels to pixels one. The TO spelled out right there in the middle. The number one at gmail.com. We're also on YouTube at panels to pixels podcast. You can subscribe to us. Give us a thumbs up. You can call us if you're into that. I don't think we've ever got a call. 845-350-2095. Five. Mark and I will be making an announcement shortly, I'm sure, about what we will do, be doing next. So again, thank you guys so much for coming in and talking about this film, this movie with me. I appreciate it. Appreciate all the insight you guys have had. So now, plug away. Where can you guys be heard? What are you, what are you guys liking? What are you enjoying? Whatever you want to talk about. I'll let oh, you go first. You're going to let me? Uh, to step oh, on I was only again. kidding. Good. <laughs> Good I God. <laughs> no, so, I mean, as I mentioned before, uh, right now, I'm currently on the Spotlight Podcast. The nextlevelnetwork.com is where you can find all the links for that, social media and all that stuff. That is my celebrity interview podcast, which is going to be jumping into its seventh season. Wow. Seven seasons. Yeah. Good Lord. Uh, Congrats. Thank you. That's awesome. uh, seven Seventh season starting in 2021. I've already got a number of guests book, including Richard Karn, who played Al Borland on Home Improvements. I am currently working on a number of other people like Clancy Brown and, and such. So we're going to be, oh, and James Brolin. Almost forgot about James Brolin yeah. is currently in the works right now too, <laughs> which is so surreal to me. But yeah, so working on some great guests for the seventh season. My Wilhelm podcast, which I've been working on for two too long, <laughs> two years at least, is finally launching in January, which I'm really excited about, which is a film roundtable podcast. All the information for that podcast, where you can find it, how you can submit ideas, maybe even be a, a guest host, also will be available on Next Level Radio or the Next Level Network.com. I'm going to be jumping on and, and borrow, I'm saying borrowing, Pake Seat for about 10 weeks on <laughs> Strange Indeed. 
to guest host with Rima about The Stand, which is the new miniseries coming out on CBS All Access. And Paik will be joining us for a couple of episodes as well so that his seat stays warm. Yeah. I can't, you can't keep me oh, away exactly. from that. Exactly. <laughs> Nobody can. I'm, I guess, like I, I said, I'm you. only borrowing the seat. I'm not taking it yeah. over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have the Lost podcast with my friend Kristen, which we do every week that we revisit the television show Lost, and we do it episode by episode every week, and we're currently in season four right now, and we already know what show we're doing when we're done with Lost, which is really exciting. I think that's all of my plugs. As for what I like and what I'm into right now, I'm currently into Shit's Creek, which is fucking amazing. <laughs> And I just dove earlier today, it finally, into Cyberpunk 2077, which I'm not far enough into it to say it's blowing me away, but I'm already excited. Nice. Are you playing it on no, Xbox? No, I'm playing on PS5. Are you? Okay. I have a friend who's playing it on PS4, and he literally can't get through 40 minutes without it shutting down because there's of bugs some, and There's problems, definitely so. some glitches and <sighs> bugs in the previous mm -hmm. gen versions. I say current gen versions because yeah. next gen just came out. There will be patches coming soon to fix all that. Yeah. As of so far on PS5, I have not. Exp I, there's been a couple bugs, but nothing yeah. that's taken anything away from the game for me. Yeah, which I'm, I'm not surprised. I, I don't even know why they released it for PS4. They should have just made it a next gen thing. But I know a lot of people are having a trouble getting the next gen consoles right yeah. now unless they pre-ordered them way in advance like you did oh and i was even lucky to get that pre-order <laughs> yeah so yeah and it's uh my ps5 is amazing i love it not to brag that i have it already <laughs> but i have it already and it's amazing uh but no that's it that's it for me cool all right yeah um my list is a little shorter <laughs> sorry <that's> okay um, <laughs> i'm not working as much with podcasts but that's all right but no i'm, I'm doing some fun stuff again uh Run for Your Lives podcast, which is on the Pirate Court Entertainment which is awesome. Network. Me and yeah, me and Daphne are doing yeah monster movies, disaster flicks, creature features, anything that'll make you run for your lives, whether it's the city exploding from natural causes or a monster, whatever. And the last episode that we just released this last week was Rampage, which was a part one of our Brad Payton, Dwayne Johnson double feature, because next week we will be releasing our episode over San Andreas, which includes our guest co-host. I wonder who that is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> and then, of course, yeah, uh, Ben mentioned Strange Indeed, which as they're going into the stand, so they'll be doing like the mini series, like recap, and then starting the CBS LXS show. So kind of to transition into that, the light latest episode of Strange Indeed that is out is me and Rima bridging the gap from Haunting a Blind Manor by Mike Flanagan that we did before by doing a Mike Flanagan directed Stephen King adaptation movie, we did Doctor Sleep. So that was and then really going cool. into a Stephen yeah, King oh, miniseries, one. yeah, it was, it was cool. a, it's a pretty yeah. cool transition. <laughs> yes, yes, and obviously I could be heard right here. Panels to Pixels is on the Next Level Podcast Network, and I send voicemails to various other uh, podcasts that my friends do. So Steve again, can be heard on every podcast that everybody just, does, and I love just it. about, <laughs> just yeah. about. But again. Calls into all of them. Even if he doesn't watch the movie, he it's calls into us true. every week too. So we appreciate that. <laughs> uh, again, thank you so much, guys, uh, for coming on. Thanks, everyone, for listening. I'm hey, Steve. Hey, real, oh, real quick, before yeah. you sign off, I, I just want to say to Mark's Adrenaline Cinema podcast. Yes. Also on the Pirate Core Entertainment Network, which yeah. he's he's been into. So since he's not on this episode, I think it only fair that one of us mentions that and gives him a plug for that as well. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. bringing that up. I was, I would be totally in <laughs> trouble. And I was on the last episode uh, where we covered the movie Commando uh, with Arnold Schwarzenegger. So that was a fun, fun watch of that. All right. Well, thank you everyone for listening. I'm Steve. I'm Ben. And I'm Pate. And we'll see you on the next panel. Good night. Good night.